Hello, this is Jeremy once again, and in this video we're going to go through how to use the first derivative to understand the behavior of graphs of different functions. So as usual, what I've decided to do is go through a couple of different examples that I feel illustrate uh, some of the complications that can come up, because the shorter examples you can do on your own. So the biggest thing is the idea of critical values and understanding that this is where the behavior of a function changes. Not every value that we find through our procedure will be a critical value, but when it is, it's important because it will indicate, again, we're either going from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So this first example is a typical type of uh, function we would analyze. And so again, if I want to find the critical values and if I want to understand when f of x is increasing or decreasing, everything starts with finding f prime. So I got to find the derivative first. In this particular function, it's just a polynomial, so f prime is pretty quick to find. I want to put it right up here. f prime of x would be minus 4x cubed plus 100x. Okay, now I have to start thinking about where are the important points, not the critical values, but the partition numbers. This is anywhere where f prime equals 0 or f prime is undefined. The first thing I look at is f prime being a polynomial f prime is defined everywhere. So when I go to start thinking, well, what are my partition numbers? I say, well, f prime is a polynomial, so f prime is defined everywhere. So that's not going to help me. There's no partition numbers coming from there. Next step is say, well, where does f prime equal zero? So this is essentially going to be an equation to solve because f prime would equal zero wherever this equation equals zero. So f prime equals zero when minus 4x cubed plus 100x equals 0. So what I want to know is the x values that make this happen. So I'm going to solve this equation. Now you may look at the x cubed and think, oh, I don't know what to do here. But notice both of these terms have an x. So what I can actually do is factor out an x. In fact, both of these terms have a 4 in them because this has a minus 4, while this, you can think of it as 4 times 25, right? So if I take out a minus 4x, then I'm left with here an x squared. And over here, since I took out a negative, it's going to be a minus. And 4 times 25 is 100, and I took out the x. So now that I factored this, I can use a zero product rule and say, well, it must be that minus 4x equals 0, x squared minus 25 equals 0. This gives me x equals 0. And this gives me x squared equals 25. In other words, x equals plus or minus so now I have partition numbers. 0, minus 5, and 5. These aren't in order, obviously. The question is, are these critical values? Partition numbers are going to be critical values only if they are in the domain of our original function. Notice all of these are in the domain. In other words, if you plug in 0, you're OK. It's just a polynomial. If you plug in minus 5, you're OK. Plug in 5, you're OK. So it turns out that these are actually the critical values as well. So when I, when I want to answer just what are the critical values, I can just say, okay, the critical values are 0, minus 5, and 5. That means that these are points where the function is changing. Once again, what could happen here is that you have a partition number, but when you plug it into f, it's undefined. And so it wouldn't be a critical value, meaning it's not a candidate to be a local max or a local min but something else is going on, like maybe there's an asymptote there or something. And the function, you know, I should be more clear, the function is changing at an asymptote, but in a very different way. All right, so I found the critical values. The next step is to find the intervals over which f of x is increasing or decreasing. So now I take my partition numbers. That's why they're called partition numbers, because I'm going to use these to partition up a number line. Okay, I'm going to put them in order, so minus 5 will come first then 0, and then 5. All right, I want to understand when f prime is positive or negative. See, the idea is when f prime is positive, the function's increasing. When f prime is negative, the function's decreasing. These points are where the sign might have changed because it crossed the axis, so it might have changed here. It also indicates if we had, for example, uh, a spot where f prime was undefined, the same thing could happen. We cross the axis. I'm going to put an f prime here so I remember what I'm working with. And so now what I got to do is I got to pick a number less than minus 5. I got to pick a number between minus 5 and 0, and the number between 0 and 5, 
a number after five. So these numbers are like test values, okay? So the first value I'm gonna pick is something easy, x equals minus six. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna plug in the value x minus six into f prime and see what sign I get. Okay, so if I do that, then f prime of minus six, and you just use your calculator here. Well, when I plug it in, I get positive 264. So what's important is not the number really, it's the sign. So I'm gonna put right here, okay, we're positive on this side of minus five. And there's a theorem in the book that justifies this. Okay, between minus five and zero, you know, I think the easiest X to work with would be minus one. Why am I picking minus one? I just have to pick some number between minus five and zero. I picked what I thought would be the easiest to work with. So F prime of X equal minus one would be minus 96. So we have a negative value here. So that means everything, since this is continuous on this interval is negative, everything you plug in here between minus five and zero will be negative when you plug it into F prime. Okay, between zero and five, I could pick X equals positive one. Okay, when I put in positive one, I end up with positive 96. So this is positive on this interval. And finally, I need to pick a value bigger than five. I'll just pick the next whole number. So F prime of six would equal negative 264. Notice that I didn't take for granted this behavior where you see how it's symmetric. I didn't take that for granted because that's not going to happen with every function. So I don't want to get in the habit of assuming that it will. Okay, once I have these, anywhere where F prime is positive is where F of X, the graph of F of X, the original function is increasing. So I could say that F of X is increasing on the intervals from minus infinity to minus five. and zero to five. Anywhere where it's negative is decreasing. So f of x is decreasing on the intervals minus five to zero and five to infinity. Now sometimes instead of the and, people will put a little union symbol so they'll put this, and that's the same thing, same idea. Okay, so we got our intervals, we got our critical values. What about the local extrema? Local extrema occur only at critical values, possibly. Okay, so it depends on the function, the behavior of the function. So I go in here and I say, okay, here we went from positive to negative. Think about that for a second. We went from increasing, so rising, to decreasing. So that would be a local max because it's up high, a local max. So there's a local max. I'm going to put this down here. At x equals minus 5. Now if I plug in minus 5, I can know exactly what that point is. Now up here, I went from negative to positive. So I was decreasing and then started increasing. So that's going to be a local min. So we have a local min at x equals 0. And then finally for five, I went from increasing to decreasing. So that must also be a local max. So I can down here, I can say local max x equals five and minus five and five. All right, so all this information right now, we're just doing an analysis, but later on this will let us uh, graph a function without even having to touch a calculator, except for maybe some of this type of work. So it'll be really, really useful. So taking a look at the graph of this function, you can see uh, where the changes happened, right? Notice what I have here at minus five, function went from increasing to decreasing, right? So that's where that local max was. Notice how it's the highest point in a small region. Notice this is the lowest point in a small region. And notice this is the highest point in a small region. At x equals five, the point's actually here, right? The point's not five. The point's five comma, looks like 500 something. So these, are our local maxes and here is our local min. Whenever you have a, a point that is a little higher than the others for a region, it's the highest point in a little region or the lowest point in a little region. Okay, so let's take a look at another function. So this example is uh, very similar, but a big thing that I noticed that's different 
is that we have an x plus 1 in the denominator. It's not a polynomial, a really nice function like before. So what this tells me is that we might end up with some partition numbers that are not critical values, depending on how the function works out. But as usual, as before at least, the way to answer this question is to first find the derivative and then we'll analyze everything from there. Since this is a rational function, what I'm going to use is the quotient rule to find f prime of x. So I'm going to write out the product twice with subtraction in between it. Divide by the denominator squared. First thing gets prime, second thing gets prime. Okay, so this is going to be 2x times x plus 1 minus x squared. And then the derivative of x plus 1 is 1, so we don't have to worry about writing that out. Then I have over x plus 1 squared. Okay, now looking at this, we want to simplify as much as possible, even though we're not really going to circle some answer and say there's the derivative, we're using it. Uh, and to use it, we want to be able to work with it as easily as possible, which means getting rid of any extra information by simplifying. So here I see an x squared, but 2x times x will also have an x squared in it, so things will simplify. If I multiply those first two terms, I get 2x squared plus 2x minus x squared from over there. And 2x minus x squared is just x squared, and then we got our 2x. All right, so here's the simplified derivative. Okay, there's my f prime of x, so I can kind of keep track. I'm just going to kind of make a little mark so I can see where that is. Okay, now remember what we need to do. We need to figure out our partition numbers. Partition numbers are going to be where f prime is uh, 0, and that's a horizontal tangent line for the graph of f, and we want to know where f prime is undefined. In this case, f prime will be undefined wherever the denominator is equal to 0 because that's a place where we're dividing by 0. So f prime is undefined when x plus 1 squared equals 0. In other words, this is going to be when x equals minus 1. That's the only way that this could be uh, equal to 0. Okay, what about when f prime equals 0. Well, again, it's a rational function, so the only way a fraction can equal 0 is if the numerator is 0. So it must be that x squared plus 2x equals 0. So in other words, to, I want to solve this, so I got x, I'm going to factor out an x, times x plus 2 equals 0, so x equals 0, and x equals minus 2. So our partition numbers from this information Partition numbers are minus 1, 0, and minus 2. Okay, what about the critical values? The critical values are going to be the partition numbers where f, the original function, is defined. When I plug in minus 1 into f, I get a 0 on the bottom of the fraction, so that means that it's undefined there. So our critical values... will not include minus 1, but it will include 0 and minus 2, since plugging those into f doesn't do anything to mess up the function. Okay, so we got all this information now. Now we got to figure out what the signs are over the different intervals to figure out if f prime, or use f prime to understand if f is increasing or decreasing, and then we can figure out any local extrema. We're going to use the partition numbers when we do that. Okay, so I've cleared my screen. I got the pieces of information. I need the partition numbers and f prime. So what I'm going to do is break up a number line, partition a number line with these partition numbers. So minus 2 would come first. Then we would have our 0. Oh, and then we would have our minus 1. And then we would have our 0. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to figure out what's happening with the sign of f prime in each of these intervals. So I need something more negative than minus 2, so I guess the easiest one would be x equals minus 3. So these are just test values. f prime of minus 3. Remember, you're really interested in what the sign of this is, but we'll go ahead and calculate the number, which is positive 0.75. Again, you could probably do that in your head uh, or use a calculator. I'm always very careful because I want to make sure I get the sign right. So that means that f prime is positive here. So that doesn't mean f of x is positive there. It means f of x is increasing on that interval. Okay, and then I say, oh, well, what about x equals, and now I need something between minus 2 and minus 1. Oh, that's too bad because they're both whole numbers, right? 
So I'm going to have to say, well, I guess I'll have to pick something not as nice. Maybe I'll choose minus 1.5. So I'll say, okay, F prime of minus 1.5 is going to equal, and so I plug it in, figure out the sign. Remember, that's what you're interested in is what's the sign. And I get negative 3, so the sign is negative. So on this entire interval then, because this is a continuous function on that interval, I can say every x you plug in, f prime, will be negative in between these two numbers. Okay, now I need something between minus 1 and 0. Once again, these are both whole numbers, so I'm kind of stuck. I think the best thing to do would be pick a minus 0 0.5. So f prime of minus 0 0.5. Remember, I'm mainly interested in the sign, and I'm plugging into f prime, so I got to do minus 0 0.5 squared plus 2 times minus 0 0.5, and then divided by, and then I plug in minus 0 0.5 where the x is, so it'll be minus 0 0.5 plus 1 quantity squared. And I also get a negative 3. So I'm still negative here. So minus 1 is an interesting point. So we're not changing from positive to negative here. So this won't be an extrema. Now finally, I need to pick something in this interval. So something bigger than 0. Oh, well, that's going to be much easier because I can just pick x equals 1. And so remember, you're plugging it into here. So I get 1 squared plus 2. So that's positive, right? I can do this one in my head. 1 squared plus 2. So that's going to be a positive 3 divided by 1 plus 1 squared. Four, so we're going to get 3, 4, so this is positive out here. Okay, now when I go to figure out uh, the local extrema, I'm going to have to pay attention to that point where x equals minus 1. Okay, so let's figure out first, though, where f of x is increasing or decreasing. Wherever I see a positive, that's where f, the original function, is increasing. So I would say f is increasing on the intervals, minus infinity to minus 2. And then I'll do the union symbol this time, 0 to infinity. And f is decreasing wherever I put a minus. So it's decreasing on the intervals, minus 2 to minus 1. Union, notice I'm not including the minus 1 here. Something's going on at that minus 1, because remember, minus 1 was not a critical value. So I want to put not a critical value. So I want to remember that. So union minus 1 out to 0. Something was going on there. That's why that point's there. So you don't include it over here. Okay, now i got to figure out where I have local extrema. Okay, so I'm going to go over here. There's a thing in your book where you can memorize this. But to me, it's easier to say, okay, I'm increasing and then I'm decreasing. So that's going to be a local max. Here I'm decreasing, decreasing. So there's nothing here as far as a local extrema goes. Local extreme point. Local extreme is plural, local extreme point. And here I go from minus to pos plus, so it's decreasing to increasing, so that's a local min. So we have a local max at x equals minus 2, and we have a local min at x equals 0. All right, so once again, we're analyzing this function quite in depth. And remember, the goal later will be to use all this to somehow graph it. Let's take a look at what the graph of this looks like and compare it to what we had before. OK, here's this function. Notice that uh, I, I have little red dots where our extrema are. So x equals minus 2. So the actual extreme point is minus 2. It looks like minus 2, about minus 5, approximately. So we have a, a local max at x equals minus 2, because notice it's increasing and then decreasing. And I'll zoom in in a second and show you a little bit better. And then at 0, we were decreasing, and then we start increasing. That line at minus 1, that's, that's actually an asymptote. So that was going on at that line. So notice nothing was going on as far as a local min or max. Zooming in a little bit, you can see a lot more clearly with that change that happens at x equals minus 2 and x equals 0, where we go from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing.